So let's look at these transducers. Let's look at these transducers. If we start with the, uh, the rods, it turns out that you have about 20 times more rods than you do cones. Okay, so about 20 times more rods than cones. So mostly what you have in your eye are these rods and not the cones. They tend to be peripherally located. Uh, we're going to find out in a minute here that in the center of our visual axis, an area called the fovea, we have only cones. Right? So the rods tend to be uh, peripherally located. Uh, they contain a pigment called rhodopsin. And in order to make rhodopsin, you need a vitamin. Somewhere, somebody told you what that vitamin was? Vitamin A. Vitamin A, right? So in order to make uh, rhodopsin, you've got to have uh, vitamin A. If we look at this molecule of rhodopsin, what we find is that it is able to absorb light, photons. And when the rhodopsin is in its active state, ready to be triggered state, it turns out that the, we don't care what carbon it is, but it turns out that carbon number 11, that the, the uh, bonds there are in the cis form. When light strikes the rhodopsin, it breaks those bonds and changes the molecule so that it rotates and goes into the trans form and energy is released. And that starts the series of chemical reactions that eventually allow us to see light. Right? So the change from the cis to the trans. Uh, once you have formed the trans form and sent the, an, an impulse, getting it back to the cis form takes a, a fair amount of time <coughs> to, to get it actually reactivated. Uh, get, if you will, dark sensitized or dark adapted. Yes? Does this have anything to do with the cells that actually eat off the end of the rods and cones at no, certain times? No. So this really has to do just with the bond that's in there and the, the light ray hits those, the, the rhodopsin, changes its form and causes a series of, impulse, of, of chemical changes that eventually cause an action potential that go then out into the ganglia um, and come back. Uh, so this process uh, of uh, getting them back into the cis form, I said, takes a while. We call that dark adaptation. So if we closed the door, turned off all the lights, uh, and all of a sudden I uh, threw $20 bills in the air, should we try that experiment? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't be able to see the $20 bills because we're all light adapted right now. It takes time to get the rods active. Right? And you've all experienced this, right? So if you uh, walk into a dark room, it's really hard to, to see. I remember when, when Nathan was little, uh, sometimes on rainy afternoons, I would take him to a uh, matinee, right? So, well, there's nothing else to do. Let's go see a matinee. If you, when you have small kids, folks, you're always late. Kids have no understanding of, of time. And so we would show up at the theater, the movie would already be going, uh, and I'd oftentimes be carrying Nathan, or sometimes I'd have him by the hand, but I'd come in, and all I could see was the screen in the front of the theater. Uh, and so we would go and try to find a seat. I'd sit in a couple of people's laps, right? Uh, eventually sit down, but if I waited about 15 or 20 minutes, I could look around and see everyone in the theater. Well, what happened? During that time, all of the rhodopsin in my eyes started going back into the cis form so that it was active and could be fired, right? So it takes 15 to 30 minutes really to activate that, that rhodopsin. Uh, it's, a, it's a continuum, uh, but to get it really activated it takes about 30 minutes. Uh, when pilots are gonna fly at night, they like to keep them in dark rooms ahead of time or they'll put red goggles on them because red light rays don't activate the, the rhodopsin. Uh, you know, when a pilot takes off, there's not gonna be any street lights up there, right? Uh, they want them to be able to see what's around them, so they keep them in a, a darkened room uh, ahead of time. Uh, vitamin A, I said, required to form rhodopsin. Taking extra vitamin A isn't gonna mean you're gonna see better at night. So if you're deficient in vitamin A, yes, you will get night blindness. 
but excess vitamin A doesn't cause better vision. Uh, and there's really, if you, your parents told you eat your carrots, you'll see better at night, it's really not their fault. It's really a, the fault of some propagandists, if you will, during uh, World War II. So during World War II, the Battle of Great Britain, if you will, the uh, Germans were coming in and bombing Great Britain at, at night, uh, sometimes in the day too, but the United States and, and British uh, uh, Army scientists had developed sophisticated radar that they could use to track the planes. Uh, they didn't want the Germans to know that they had developed sophisticated radar, and that's why they were shooting them down so well. At about that same time is when the information came out that vitamin A was required for rhodopsin. So they put out in the, the propaganda, the newspapers at the time, that the reason that the UK pilots and American pilots were doing so well is they were feeding them lots of carrot juice. Uh, and so I'm sure then the Germans, right, started loading up their their <laughs> pilots with carrot juice. Yeah, question. Yeah, what was the term used that it takes so long to get back? Is it dark and something? Uh, it's a dark adaptation. Dark adaptation. Now, part of dark adaptation, of course, is dilation of the pupil as well. But uh, the actual changing it back into the active form uh, takes takes quite a while. Okay, uh, so those are our rods. What about the cones? The cones are for color vision. Okay, they allow us to, to see color. They have other special opsins in them, okay, photopsins, uh, like rhodopsin. And it turns out that we have three different types of rods. Rods that are best, or rods, excuse me, cones. Uh, three different types of cones. Cones that are for red light, for green light, and for blue light. So red, green, and blue. These cones are always active. So unlike the rods, they are always active. So if you go out at night and, and you're dark adapted, and it's, you're, right, you're walking along, maybe you have a flashlight, and all of a sudden you turn the flashlight on and shine it on a green tree, you see a green tree. Right? So you don't have to wait for the cones to become active. They are always active. Yes? I think there are rare people, I've read that there are rare people who actually have four, and they tend to be artists and like hyper sensitive to differences fourth. in color. I haven't read that. A fourth type of cone? I yeah. haven't read that. But it could be, you know, really what we're talking about is the ability to absorb certain light rays. So maybe <laughs> I just have not read that. Also, stargazers um, know about the thing about the rods being on the outside. Because if you're trying to see a star, and it's not, not very bright from where you're looking at it. it um, if you look next to the star, you can you see That's can exactly see. right. So it turns out that your cones are concentrated in this area that we call the fovea centralis. And so there's the optic disc, but there's this area, they didn't do a very good job of trying to show it here. But there's this area called the fovea centralis that's right in the center of your visual axis. And that area has only cones, no rods. You have cones in the periphery as well. Okay, so certainly you can see color off to the side, but your cones are highly concentrated in this area that we call the fovea centralis, where there are no rods. And as a consequence of having no rods in your fovea, if you want to see something at night, don't look right at it, which is pretty peculiar, right? But you don't want to look straight at it. Uh, I knew this as a kid, and I didn't know why, but I grew up on a ranch. At night, we'd go out and look at the summer stars, and I'd have competition with my brothers to see who could see the faintest star. And so I would see a real faint star off the side, and then I'd turn and look at it, and it would disappear. It's like, what happened? I didn't know, right? But it turns out your phobia has no rods. It only has cones. And the cones are for red, green, and, and blue light. <clears throat> uh, from those three types of cones, we make all the colors of the rainbow, which is pretty peculiar, right? Red, green, blue make all the colors of the rainbow. So when you were in grade school, second grade, third grade, and the teacher said, okay, you can go get some paints and mix them and make whatever colors you want. What were the three paint colors that you wanted? 
Yellow. Red, yellow, and blue. And you made all your colors from those three, right? So what the heck's going on here? It turns out that when we are seeing color, we're adding color together. When you're painting, you are subtracting color. So if we look, red and green make yellow. It's like, what? <laughs> red and green make yellow, but that's because we're adding them, not subtracting them. You see, when you look at something, it's not a very blue shirt, but maybe look at you know the, the red shirts up here. The reason those shirts appear red is that all other colors have been absorbed except for one color, which is the red, which is reflecting back to your eye. So when they made the red sweatshirts, they put in a pigment that would absorb all the colors except red. <laughs> all right? So painting, dyeing, those are subtractive functions. Our eyes are added to adding the color waves together. Many years ago, right, way too long ago, uh, you would go to pizza parlors and they would show movies on a giant screen in there. So while you're eating your pizza, right, you could watch a movie. And they didn't have plasma TVs in those days. Uh, instead, they would project the movie up on the screen with three large colored lights. Guess what three colors they used? Red, green, blue. You could do this on your own at home. I haven't tried this on a plasma TV, but I'm sure it should still work. But on the older color TVs, it was really obvious. If you got really, really close and looked at how they were making those colors, you would see three colored dots bunched together. They were red, green, blue, and they activate those three colors to make all the colors that you see. I'll have to get up next to a plasma TV and see it, if it works that way. Uh, all the colors added together then make white. All the colors subtracted together make black, right? So if this is an additive process, not a subtractive process, and that's why the, the uh, colors come out that way. Uh, before we go to lens function, I want to mention one more picture that's pretty interesting. Actually, before I, I, I'll tell you the story, then I'll tell you the, the other pigment. So, well, quite a few years ago, maybe five or six years ago, they bred some, some rats that had no rods or cones. When they would shine the light in the rat's eyes, the rat's pupils still constricted. So how could this be, right? I mean, they have no rods or cones, but their pupils still constrict when they're exposed to light. The rats also still seem to be more active at, uh, well, they, rats aren't that way, but other animals that are nocturnally active, they were, were blind, were more active at night than they were during the daylight, even though they couldn't see light. They didn't know why until eventually they isolated a particular pigment in the ganglion cells that is called melanopsin. And melanopsin is sensitive to light, but it's located in those cells that I had up there a minute ago for the retina. Get back to that, here we go. Right, so located in these ganglion cells. Right, so located in here, the special thing with melanopsin that's sensitive to light, but doesn't allow us to see, but is involved in our biorhythms. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the, the endocrine system. So, you know, I said this was poorly designed, maybe not, right? So maybe we needed to have those ganglion cells in the front to absorb light even separately from the rods and the... <coughs> All right. I'm sorry, melanopsin is sensitive to light, but... But it doesn't allow you to see, right? It's just sensitive to... All right, so let's, let's look at, at how the, the lens functions. Yes? So when you walk out your eyes, you're still open, and you're not taking in images. Like, yeah, so somebody's been knocked unconscious? Me? When you're like sleepwalking or something like that, yeah. your eyes are open. Is that because your brain is 
Yeah, so your brain's not, not functioning. So, you know, it's kind of, where is vision? Vision's not here, folks. Vision is here, right? And so if I start electrically stimulating parts of the brain, people will see stars or whatever, but it, it's, you know, it's the same thing that these are our sense organs. The experience is in the brain. And so it doesn't matter if the eye is fully, right? I mean, it's kind of a strange thing, but you could take the eye out Right? And for some amount, short amount of time, it would continue to function, but there certainly would be no vision there because it's in the brain. Uh, so the cornea and the lens bend the light rays for us. So it turns out the cornea does most of the light ray bending. Your, your lens only does about a quarter of the bending. Uh, but we can focus that lens, and we can focus the lens. Um, maybe before we go further here, I say it does most of the, the cornea does most of the light ray bending, the lens does the rest. The obvious question is, well, why do we need to bend light rays at all? And the answer is because the images that we're looking at, for the most part, are bigger than our eye. Right? I'm almost six feet tall. You can see me right now. You can't fit me in your eye. Right? So you're taking the light rays and you're bending them down so that I'm a little tiny image rather than a big image. Back in the, way back in the 1900s, they had cameras that had film in them. Some, some stuff, instead of it being electrically done, it was done with these things, stuff called film. And so when you would take a picture of somebody, their image would be captured on the film, you would go and get it developed, and if you looked at the negatives, the people in there were little tiny people because the light rays had been bent down to be captured on the film, right? So we need something that can bend the light rays. I know you're going to ask, what is film? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually had a question back to the comment. So when they say, like, not things like the sun, is that because it will damage the cones and the rods of the eye? The Staring at the sun will damage the rods and the cones horribly, so you don't want to do that, right? Yeah, don't do that. Okay, so this diagram is trying to show the light rays being bent down uh, on the image. Uh, there's something else that's interesting about this, this diagram, and it make it to a large here, but if you look at that diagram, you'll notice that not only have the light rays been bent down, but that the image is upside down. So everything that you're looking at right now is upside down on your retina. I'm upside down. The screen is upside down. But your brain interprets it as right side up, luckily for us. Uh, many years ago, gosh, 50 years ago or so, they, uh, they decided that they should do an experiment about this. And so they said, what if we gave people lenses in front of their eyes that made the images right side up on their retina. What would happen? Well, of course, when they did this, everything was upside down. The people experienced hor horrible nausea, right? And so they were banging into things. Can you imagine trying to look at the world and everything's flipped up, right? <coughs> but they, they had these volunteers leave these lenses on their eyes for about two weeks. On average, after about two weeks, when they woke up in the morning, they looked at the world, and the world was right side up. So it wasn't a gradual change where they gradually, right, but all of a sudden they woke up, and the world was right side up. So the brain was able to take the information that was coming in and say, I can't make sense of this information. How can I interpret it? I'll make it right side up. Our brains are incredibly plastic, right, in terms of being able to be molded into to seeing what it is that we need to see. Um, Pretty amazing, right? That it was able to, that we were able, of course, when they took the lenses off, they had to go back through the process, right? To, again, I didn't want to volunteer for that, that experiment. When we look at an image, the lens is bending the light rays, in, and our lenses are a shape that we call biconvex, right? So that the light ray comes in and it's bent down versus a lens that would be biconcave. You see the two caves? And a biconcave lens bends light rays out. 
Well, when we focus our lens, we're able to change the shape of our lens. So if you're focusing a camera or focusing the microscope, when you focus, you move the lens closer or farther away from the object that you're looking at, right, with a camera or a microscope. But our eyes don't move the lens in and out. Instead, we can change the shape of our lens. So if we want to see something up close where we're going to have to do more light ray bending, we need the lens to bulge, right? become more convex. If we're trying to see something far away, we need the lens to flatten and right, not bend the light rays as much. So if I hold up my laser pointer right, from a distance, Nan's looking at it, she can see it very easily. But if I bring it up close to her eyes, she's got to do a whole lot of light ray bending right, in order to get that to fit. And so what do we do? We bulge our lens to do more light ray bending. Right? So further away, we flatten. Up close, we need to bend it. Uh, uh, the near point of your eye is the closest point that you can focus. Those of you who have lab, we check for your near points in lab. The far point of the eye for an average eye is 20 feet. Right? So the average far point is 20 feet. Um, what that means, folks, is if an image is 20 feet away or further, you don't have to do any more light ray bending. Right? For an average eye, 20 feet away or further, you don't have to do any more light ray bending. So we say the far point of the eye, the normal eye, is 20 feet. So that brings us to some obvious eye abnormalities. Right? Some abnormalities of, of the eye. A condition called myopia, nearsightedness. Myopia is nearsightedness. These people can see things up close readily, but they have a hard time seeing things far away. And so we can say that their eye is too long or their lens is too strong. Nice little rhyme there, right? Eye is too long or the lens is too strong. The reality is it's usually that their eye is, is too long. So if we look at this, this diagram is trying to show the normal shape of an eye. And then look up here in this case where the person has myopia. Do you see that they have watermelon eye? Yes? But can that be something that develops over time? Well, so the question is, can it develop over time? Sure. You know, your eye, particularly when you're, when you're growing, your eye tends to change shape a great deal. And you get older, not as much, but it still can change some shape. And so any change in the shape of the eye or the lens or the cornea will change where the image uh, focuses. And that can be caused from like outside influences as well, diet? Uh, no, probably. So the question is, is diet going to change this? None that I've read of. Uh, so diet's not going to change whether you have myopia or not. Uh, if you were deprived of vitamin A, night blindness but um, so when your eye when your head is growing and your eyes are growing right so for instance for a child you can get a lot of change in the shape of the, the eye so if the eye is too long or sometimes the lens too strong but it's usually right the eye is too long if we look at that when the image focuses we find the focal point the retina is behind there and so everything that that the person tries to look at, especially if it's far away, is going to be out of focus. Right? It, does it make sense that they, they are bending the light rays too much for their eye? But so if you have to bend the light rays a lot when something's near, they can see things that are close. They have a hard time seeing things far away. When this occurs, we say they have myopia, and they might have vision something like you might say 20 one <laughs> meaning from 20 feet away, looking at an eye chart, they see what a normal person could be 100 feet back and still see normally. Okay, so we would say they have 20, 100 vision versus a normal person standing on a 20-foot line, looking at a 20-foot chart, right, sees from 
20 feet, what a normal person sees from 20 feet, so they have 20-20 vision. Okay? But they might have 20-100 in one eye and 20-20 in the other, right? It doesn't have to be the same in, in each eye. Um, I was talking to my ophthalmologist a while back, and he was telling me that uh, in Japan, normal vision, you gotta remember what normal means. Normal means average. Normal vision is actually myopia because this is the shape of the head and the eye is inherited, and most people that are born in Japan have myopia. Pretty interesting, right? Uh, well, if the problem is that they're bending the light rays too much, right? So this diagram is trying to show the, the black dots. They're bending the light rays too much. We could give them a concave lens that will spread the light rays out before it hits their cornea, then their image will be put right where it's supposed to on the back of their retina, right? So we'll give them a concave lens, spread the light rays out, and allow the image to form right where it's supposed to, to fit. You know from, gosh, just all the advertisements that you hear on radio, TV, newspapers, whatever, that you can have surgery to correct this condition if you have myopia. Uh, I think it's interesting that the first discovery of surgery for correcting myopia was a serendipity, uh, serendipitous uh, a discovery uh, occurred in Russia. A uh, young boy had glasses on, fell. When he fell, the glasses broke and pieces of the glass entered his cornea. He went to the ophthalmologist. The ophthalmologist picked out the pieces of the glass, patched the eye. When he figured the cornea had healed, he unpatched the eye, and it was a miracle. The kid could now, child could now see normally out of that eye. Of course, the ophthalmologist was very curious. How did this happen? How could this child now see normally? Well, it turns out that the child had essentially done radio keratotomy on himself. <laughs> so the, the pieces of glass had made radial incisions into the cornea and flattened the cornea down. All right? And so if, we, if the lens was too strong or the cornea was too strong and you flatten the cornea, the image then was bent the way that it was supposed to. So, uh, this was really the first time that this had occurred, and from that came a very early form of surgery to correct myopia called radial keratotomy. Really not done much anymore uh, because there are other much more effective uh, techniques. Uh, the techniques that you hear advertised now are LASIK surgery, where they cut a little flat and then they use a laser to reshape the, the cornea. Uh, we also have another type of surgery uh, for the cornea called PRK. In, in both these cases, they're reshaping the cornea of the lens so that the light rays are bent the way that they're supposed to to uh, land on the, the retina. Uh, I've been very fortunate in my life. I haven't needed uh, to wear glasses other than reading glasses. Uh, my sister, not so fortunate, severe myopia. Uh, and many years ago, she went in and had uh, LASIK, LASIK surgery. She's very happy with it. Um, you know, if you're considering this kind of surgery, you certainly want to talk to the ophthalmologist ahead of time. And I think you'd want to have, ask two major questions. The first question you'd want to ask is, of patients that you've done surgery on that had my vision, how many of them no longer have to wear glasses? Because that's really what you're interested in, right? Uh, so. Patients that have my vision, how many no longer have to wear glasses? The second question I think is maybe even more important is, how many surgeries do you do in a year? Right? And you want to go to somebody that does thousands of these a year, folks. Don't go to somebody that does 10 or 15 a year. You want somebody that does it all the time and so they can do a good job, they're used to doing it, and they'll give you a good, good result. All right. That's true for all surgeries. That's true for any surgery. Absolutely, it's true for any surgery, right? So you want, how often does a surgeon do the surgery? I'll go off on a quick tangent here. We have, when we get to the endocrine system, I'll talk more about it. But many years ago, I had a, a student that had a tumor in her pituitary. 
It was diagnosed in Salinas, and the uh, endocrinologist uh, uh, working with a neurosurgeon wanted to do surgery, and, and she asked me what I thought, and I said, well, ask them how many times they've done it. And her, she came back, she said, well, they said they've only assisted, they've never done it on their own. And I said, go up to UC San Francisco, and she did, and they found, it turns out there were two surgeons working up there that had done thousands of these surgeries, and the next semester I saw her, she looked completely different because they had corrected the uh, abnormality in her uh, pituitary, very successful outcome. But don't be the first people to have this done. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, the opposite of myopia, hyperopia, far-sightedness. So we have to just think opposite. If the problem in myopia was that the eye was too long or the lens was too strong, then we've got the opposite problem in hyperopia, that is the lens is not strong enough or the eye is too short. Uh, so let's go back to this, this picture, right? So there's the normal eye, here's watermelon eye, right? myopia, but here's hyperopia. So it's, it's not real obvious, but if you look, the eye is a little too short. All right, so the eye's a little too short here. So when they look at an image, what they would focus on is actually focused, be, would be focused behind their retina. And so if we needed to give the patient with myopia a concave lens, what do we need to give the patient with hyperopia? A convex lens, right? So we're gonna give them a convex lens. It will start the light ray bending early so that the image focuses where it's supposed to focus. They would have been, uh, vision, a, a hyper, person with hyperopia like maybe 2010, meaning from 20 feet away from the eye chart, they can see what a normal person would have to be standing on the 10 foot line. <coughs> right, so 2010 vision. Presbyopia, old man's eye, presbyopia. Yes? Is there surgery for hyperopia? Is there surgery for hyperopia? Actually, they are doing some surgeries for hyperopia, uh, but it's not a very common one. And usually, hyperopia allows people to see things distance, and they usually don't have too much of a problem seeing things. Uh, so it's really almost a greater eye. So they'd have to have very severe hyperopia, uh, but they are doing some LASIK surgery now. Presbyopia, old man's eye. So it turns out that presbus means old man. All right, so it means old man. I had a student a number of years ago, she raised her hand, she said, I'm a Presbyterian, what's that make me? Uh, it can also mean an elder. It doesn't have to be an old man, right? So uh, it turns out that as we age, our lens becomes less flexible. Recall, again, when we want to look at something up close, our lens has to bulge. Right? If you can't make that lens bulge, you won't be able to see things up close very well. Right? You're going to have a hard time doing that. So um, as we age, the lens becomes less flexible and it becomes hard to focus on things that are near. We call this presbyopia. To help a person that has presbyopia, the answer's up there, but what kind of lens? Convex. Convex. Right, so we can give them a convex lens to help them bend the light rays ahead of time. This typically becomes a problem after about the age of, of 40. Um, I have reading glasses now. When, you know, when I got into my 40s, I started to notice not so much that I needed reading glasses, but when I would look at something up close, like my notes, and then I would look out at the students, uh, it seemed almost like my eyes were creaking. Right, so uh, when it used to be able to quickly, I could adjust from far to near, near to far. I would look at my notes and look up, and my eyes kind of went. Uh, right. So uh, anyway, this, this condition is called presbyopia. By the way, um, if you have myopia and you decide to go get surgery to get this corrected, then sometime down the line, when you get older, you're going to end up with. Presbyopia, right? Inability to see near. Sometimes ophthalmologists will recommend before you have the surgery 
that you try some contact lenses to see if you are a candidate to have so-called monovision. That is to put one corrective lens in one eye but leave the other eye uncorrected. What can happen in many people is the brain learns quickly to use one eye for far vision and one eye for near vision. If you are able to do that, and some people, they have nausea and headaches, all kinds of problems, but most people can adapt. If you're able to do that, then when you go to have the surgery, you wouldn't want to have both eyes corrected for myopia. You'd only get one eye corrected, leaving the other eye, right, for near vision, one eye for far vision. So something to think about uh, if you ever get to that. that. So Nan asked about glaucoma earlier. Um, glaucoma is a condition where the drainage of the canal of Schlem is incorrectly matched to the production that's coming from the ciliary body. Uh, really what we're talking about here, folks, is kind of the same thing that we talked about when we talked about hydrocephalus. Right? So the, there's a non-matching of fluid production and fluid drainage. When fluid begins to accumulate in the eye, the pressure builds up in the anterior cavity, but the anterior cavity, because it's a sphere, pushes all the way back around on the posterior cavity and starts to pinch the optic disc. When you start pinching that optic disc, you destroy the optic nerves, and blood vessels. And so oftentimes the first symptom that the patient presents with is they'll say they're losing their peripheral vision and they're starting to see kind of a halo effect when they look at something. So out in the periphery, vision's lost. In the center, they can still see well. Well, by the time they present with this, it's too late. They have had damage to their nerves and their, their blood vessels. So we don't want it to get to this state. We want to check it early. It's a silent disease. You can't feel the increased pressure in your eye. So every time you show up at the optometrist or the ophthalmologist, what do they do? They Pop check eye. the pressure in oh. your eye. So they have two different techniques for doing that. One is they can shoot a little puff of air at the eye and it, they check to see how much it moves in. So it's not unlike me tossing a volleyball to you and saying, check and tell me if this is a good pressure. And you'd take your thumbs in and go, mm. oh yeah, that's just right, right? So they're checking to see how much the eye deflects in. They can also put an instrument directly on the eye after they've anesthetized the eye, but they put an instrument directly on the eye that can measure the pressure in the eye. If they determine that you have excessive pressure, they will want to try to treat that, right? To stop you from, from getting the damage uh, to the, um, the nerves, the optic nerve. Uh, most often treated with drops to the eye. Um, an older treatment's been around for a long time, but, but still effective, is to use a drug <clears throat> called pilocarpine. Pilocarpine causes the iris of the eye to constrict. Okay? Causes the iris of the eye to constrict. Let's go back to the iris for a minute here, way back. So, if you look, there's the, the iris, right? We can adjust that, the pupil there. So if you look at the iris, there are radial muscles that, when they contract, cause the pupil to open. But there are also circular muscles, they're not really showing them here, but there are circular muscles that cause the, the pupil to constrict. So if we put this drug, hyaloparpine, in the eye, it causes those radial muscles to constrict which makes the pupil smaller. That doesn't really solve the problem. What solves the problem is... Oh, you, you mean it causes, the, it causes the circular muscles? You said the radial muscles. It causes the circular... I'm sorry, circular muscles. Circular muscles. Thanks for paying attention there, Dan. Uh, 
So look, here's, there's the canal of Schlem. Here's the iris. So if we constrict the circular muscles and pull the iris away from the cornea, right? right? We pull it away from there out to the center. Do you see that it opens up that area a little bit more? Can you picture that? So you're going to cause the pupil to constrict, the iris right pulling in. It pulls away from the canal of Schlem, this direction right away, and it increases the draining. So, so pilot heart beam drops have been used forever. Um, they can use drugs that we call beta blockers. We'll talk more about beta blockers when we get to the autonomic nervous system. But they can use beta blockers, and beta blockers uh, st help stop the production of fluid. Okay, so they can use beta blockers that'll stop the production of the fluid. Or they can use prostaglandin analogs. So remember prostaglandins? Hormone-like chemicals. Uh, analog means they act like these prostaglandins, and the prostaglandin analogs increase the drainage through Schlem's canal. If they can't correct it with uh, medications, an ophthalmologist can go in and increase the size of Schlem's canal to increase drainage. Um, all right, let's stop there. So quiz on uh, Monday. Uh, and we learned that there were numerous treatments, uh, drops that could be used, or surgery if, if necessary. So that brings us to another abnormality of the eye, uh, cataracts. Uh, so here's a person with a really severe uh, cataract. In, in cataracts, the lens of the eye becomes opaque. So remember we said how wonderful it is that you've got the cells in your lens that are clear. But as we age, those proteins that the cells are producing may start to be actually cloudy. Uh, we know there are certain things that speed that up. Uh, excessive exposure to ultraviolet light or other forms of radiation, certain chemicals, but sometimes it's also just uh, age-related that the uh, proteins begin to essentially denature, right? And then they become opaque, and so the vision is, is gradually being lost. Um, would it surprise you to learn that commercial fishermen have a really high rate of cataracts? Uh, why, why would that be? Light. So they're not just getting light from above, but also light from off the water, right? So it's important when you're out, not just for fishermen, but all of you, if you're out in bright light, you want to wear sunglasses that have ultraviolet uh, protection, right? You learn to protect your skin. You need to protect your, your eyes. Uh, so, uh, cataract surgery has become really pretty straightforward. Uh, they make a small slit in the eye. They can go in and uh, uh, remove the, the old lens that's in there. Uh, and then they go in and they insert a new lens. So they're trying to show the insertion of a, a new lens here. Uh, that, that lens will then take care of the fact that the person has this cloudy vision. The cloudy vision, if you talk to people who have cataracts, severe cataracts, they'll tell you it's like looking through a steamed up window, right? So you know how, right, the window gets steamed up, the mirror gets steamed up in your bathroom. That's what it's like for them. And it really is kind of miracle surgery because they go in, they replace that lens with a plastic lens, and all of a sudden, they can see again. Before they were able to do this, before they could give plastic lenses, all they could do is remove the old lens and they would give people really thick uh, lenses on the front of their eye. But, but it's an amazing surgery. Yes? Do you think there would be an uh, adjustment time for the rods and cones? Because they uh, through this. Yeah, it doesn't. They, they have almost. So the question is, are there adjustment time for rods and cones? It's immediate. They all of a sudden just go, whoa, I can see again. And for ophthalmologists, it's a wonderful surgery, right? Because they can be miracle workers uh, and give them back their, their vision. Sir? Yes. There, is, there is an adjustment in that everything seems really, really bright. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I take but, it my rods but, were. But, but they're working. It's just yeah. that, right. But everything will seem really bright to the person because it's like all of a sudden somebody turned, somebody wiped off the mirror. It's like being a newborn because yeah. newborns see very yeah. bright stuff. Yeah. Well, it's, it's an amazing surgery, really. Uh, an abnormality of the eye called an astigmatism. That's one word, astigmatism. Uh, in an astigmatism, the cornea or the lens is warped. Okay? The cornea or the lens is warped. So 
Imagine looking through a window that one area is too thick and one area is thin. That's what it's like to have an astigmatism. Uh, and so when a person has an astigmatism, we can give them lenses that correct for the fact that the lens or the cornea is warped. So either eventually areas that are convex or concave. Uh, they can correct these things now with uh, laser surgery, so LASIK surgery. And people that have um, contact lenses can actually have astigmatisms corrected because they can put weight in the contact so that it always comes back to the same uh, position. Color blindness. It's an inherited disorder of the eye. Uh, Red-green color blindness is most common. There is a type of blue color blindness, but it's uh, very rare and it's not uh, what we call sex link. Uh, so you've heard of people having color blindness. Uh, a better term would be color weakness. Uh, but here would be um, an example of, of what happens. So, so here would be, of course, it says normal vision, and this is what somebody that had red green color blindness would see uh, instead of the, the colors that you and I see, the reds and the greens. And of course, uh, those of you that have lab, we use the uh, color blind uh, born uh, both. And so here we can see this nice number three, uh, but this would be like a color blindness, uh, a color blind person would see. So you can see something there. But it's pretty hard to pick out what exactly it is, right? And so that's what it's like to, to be colorblind. Uh, and again, uh, color weakness, a better term, because it, you can have people that have no ability to see reds and greens, but typically they have some loss of the ability to see uh, reds and, and greens. It's a sex-linked trait, meaning that it's going to be more common then in men than in women. Again, those of you who have lab, we've been through this, but not everybody has lab. So if we were to draw a Punnett square, here's X and X, the sex chromosomes for a woman. And I've given this woman on her one X chromosome a large C with color in it, so she can see color. But she has a recessive gene that says, I don't see color. All right? So she's, she can still see it, but that recessive gene doesn't allow her to make the cones that she needs, the reds and greens. She marries a man, let's say he can see color. Of course, on his X, he has the big C. He can see color. Uh, the Y chromosome does not carry this gene. So the Y chromosome doesn't carry the gene. So if this sperm fertilizes this egg, you end up with a normal female. Both genes are normal, she sees color. This daughter sees color, but carries recessive trait. This male child sees color, uh, right? It's only one gene, but it's the normal gene. But this male child inherits the colorblind trait from his mother on the X chromosome. Uh, and so he would be unable to see color because he has no other gene that says to be able to see it, because males only get one copy. You can end up with females that are colorblind, and for that to occur, you need the father to have the small c, that is for him to be colorblind, and then the mother has to at least be a carrier, and so two small c's here would mean that that female child is colorblind. Uh, you don't need to know percentages, but it turns out about 7% of the male population is colorblind, only about 1% of the female population is, is colorblind. Right? Because it's hard for the colorblind male to find the gene in the woman that also uh, makes the, and then uh, for a, a daughter that's colorblind. Geneticists have been very curious about uh, this gene. Uh, you know, we'll talk more about this as we go through the course, but in general, when we see genes that are detrimental, we expect them to be selected against, to be removed from the population so that those genes would disappear. 7% is pretty high uh, for a gene that's selected against. And so they said, what, what's going on here? We have good evidence now to, to indicate that people that are colorblind are more able to pick out things that are camouflaged than people that are not colorblind. So they're not confused by the colors. They're looking for the movements and, and the shapes. Uh, and so there seems to be an advantage then to go if you're going to be out hunting, right? hunting with somebody that's colorblind and they're going to see the, the leopard or whatever it is that you're looking for better than, than you'll be able to see it because uh, they, they have this gene that's colorblind. 
And I had a, a good friend uh, when I was in high school. I used to go pheasant hunting. I know it's horrible, I'm a murderer. Uh, but we used to go pheasant hunting, and when you're pheasant hunting, you only shoot uh, the male, the roosters. You don't shoot hens, and if you've ever seen pheasants, the males are beautifully colored, reds and greens, just really, really pretty colors. The females are gray and brown because they're supposed to sit on the nest and hide, right? So they, you don't want them to, to show up. Uh, so when I would hunt with his friend and a bird would get up, we'd always have to make sure to yell whether it was a rooster or a hen because he could not see the difference between the two. That's how severe his color blindness was. That, that's severe, right? You begin, if you've ever seen a male a rooster pheasant compared to a hen. Uh, but other people, there's only slight changes in their ability to see that in colors. All right, so that's enough on vision. Let's move on to hearing, right? Another of our special senses. 